In this video, we will talk about research design. So this is the first of a, a series of two videos in the first block of this course, which, uh, in which I will introduce a technique that will not be familiar to most people, namely DAPs. But before we go into that, Let's take a step back and think about generally what we are doing in this course. So one of the very important aspects that I want to convey in this course is the social norms that surround what we're doing in econometrics. What you have to appreciate is that we can teach you all we want about estimators, about inference about basic statistics and go to the most advanced techniques but you have to know how to apply them and how this is done in state-of-the-art research if you don't know that you will not succeed you can be a genius but if you don't know how to communicate your research and how to package it in the right way and use the right methods for the right type of question, you will not succeed in this profession. And while one, one course will not be able to teach you all of that, I will certainly put a great deal of emphasis on that. So I will, over the course of, of, of these, these lectures um, in this module, talk about the techniques as well as then some of the social norms that surround them. Okay? What you need to be aware of is that social norms in economics and in any other discipline change constantly. And so it's important to, to keep abreast of the latest techniques, but also of, of those social norms, how they change over time. To give you an example, the, the material I'm teaching in this course, causal inference, is something that for many years some mainly older economists have seen as a fact. Right? It's something that they claim is a theoretical, um, yet these, these uh, methods have dominated top journals for about 20 years now. We will see what's going to come in the future. Maybe other techniques are, are, are going to become more important than other types of questions that, that economists ask and uh, other econometric tools that they use then to answer these questions. But that's not just something that I wanted to talk about up front to give you an idea of what to expect when you become a researcher and do this um, as in, in your professional life. Okay. Um, and so what I will do here is I will blend the so-called cookbook approach where you have a certain protocol for a given technique that you should follow. Um, and I will blend that with more traditional econometrics teaching, which focuses more on the maths behind things. Um, but doesn't tell you so much about how these things are applied and why and why in a certain situation and not in another. Okay. So what's important here to, to understand is that the traditional way of teaching econometrics that you may have encountered also in your MSc course is that all methods are created equal. And then you choose for whichever uh, application you want, you choose the method that you think is most useful. And that is per se not wrong, obviously. You should use your own discretion and your own knowledge as a, as a researcher to, to make these type of choices. But you have to again be aware of those social norms. And what you will see when you read top journals is that not all methods that you learn in econometrics are equally important. So if you read papers in the top five journals or in top general interest journals or top field journals, um, you will see, for example, that of the topics that I listed here or the techniques, um, they used to be quite popular, but they no longer are. 
right? So, so try to publish a paper with uh, where the, the main regression is based on a uh, you know, on propensity score matching um, or a Heckman two-step selection model um, or wage decompositions. They have their place, but you will not see them much in top journals. And uh, I do not say here that you shouldn't learn this, and quite the opposite, we actually will learn some of these techniques. Um, but you have to, at the same time, be aware of which techniques are uh, allow you to speak to the audience that you need to convince in order to succeed in this profession. And to also simply, you know, build your profile as a researcher. So I find this very, very interesting. So important disclaimer here is, uh, have these methods become obsolete? And the answer is no, absolutely not. Um, and the reason is that, first of all, a lot of the methods that, that are currently considered state of the art build upon these methods. So for example, um, in, uh, in instrumental variable estimation, uh, we are now moving more and more towards a techni technique called marginal treatment effects, which has been around for a while, but, but is now with more and more data becoming available, is, is a more becoming a more popular uh, and more widely used method. And to understand that, it's very helpful to, to understand uh, sample selection models and, and uh, Heckman's two-step selection procedure, which helps us then to understand those, those more complex uh, causal inference methods. Um, and also, social norms change, as I mentioned. Um, a, a big example is logic models, which you saw on and off in, in, in trade and obviously in, in structural work on discrete choice. But for the last 10, 15 years, they, they had kind of, a, you know, they were kind of in a niche. Whereas now with machine learning becoming more and more uh, prevalent in, in econometrics, logic models all of a sudden have their place again and, and, and are becoming more and more um, popular and useful in new types of applications. So it's important to, to, to keep these changing social norms in mind. But let's talk, before we go into the actual techniques, let's talk about causality and about research design. Okay, so let's talk about how should you go about testing a causal hypothesis with data. That's what this lecture is about. So in, in Econometrics 1, we already talked about causality uh, through the classic potential outcomes framework. The, the idea of the potential outcomes framework is that we, want, we have a mathematical framework that allows us to compare the average outcome had people received the treatment or units um, versus and compare that to the average outcome had people not received. Right? And, and we have a whole mathematical toolkit with conditional expectations that allows us to, to analyze that. And that is very, very important, as we will also see later in the course uh, when we want to do bounding analyses. And generally, uh, it's an important analytical tool. But here in this lecture, I will and introduce a different tool, which is called DAX. DAX stands for Directed Acyclical Graph. And so what we will do is we will use this new technique um, to help us think about causal questions and to help the development of our research design. And what I think they're very important for is that they help us detect common pitfalls in empirical analyses that other techniques, notably potential outcomes, give us a harder time finding you know, or detecting. So, so DAX uh, will not be an, a replacement for potential outcomes in, in most of econometrics, but they are a very, very useful alternative. So if you want to learn more, on, on DAX, um, I will give you some um, additional literature as we go through this, through this slide deck. 
But if you look at uh, Scott Cunningham's causal inference mixtape book, uh, he has an entire chapter uh, that introduces DAGs that I can highly recommend. So what we want to analyze is causality. Okay, so so the, the Oxford Dictionary, if you look it up, what is causality? Well, it's the relationship between cause and effect. There is obviously a huge philosophical discussion to what extent one can distinguish the two and so on. Uh, whether causality actually exists. Our working hypothesis in this entire course is that it does exist. Right? But what you need to be aware of is that causality is a theoretical concept and it cannot be directly tested or proven with just with data. And that, that's also why um, you know, at the moment there is so much focus on, on, on data science and a lot on, on, on describing patterns in the data, which is obviously very interesting. Um, but there is not so much yet on causal data science. That's only very slowly coming because as we will see that the hurdles for establishing causality are, are pretty high and require a lot of uh, theoretical knowledge um, and theoretical reasoning about how we believe the world actually works. So in all this, the methods of causal inference that we are using here in, in this course and that, that we introduce here, they are they can be considered rhetorical devices. Okay, so so they, they allow us to establish causality under certain assumptions. So we need to have basically a theory that allow us then that, that, that tells us that certain assumptions are fulfilled and we can then um, establish causality under these assumptions. But obviously we have to, for each application we, we, we use these method, methods for, think very carefully, well, are these assumptions fulfilled? And so so these, these methods that we use, instrumental variables, uh, regression discontinuity, difference in difference, they're basically like a, like a, like a tool that, that one can use, but that only works under certain conditions. And we obviously have to establish in each application whether those conditions are. And so, so the important thing here is for any, also when you read papers or when you write your own papers, the, the, the key to understanding a paper and the key then to also conveying the message of your own paper is to establish what are the identifying assumptions. Okay, so, so what assumptions have to be fulfilled in order to, uh, to draw a causal conclusion. The simplest example is probably a randomized experiment where people are randomly assigned into a treatment and control group or a treatment and placebo group. And the identifying assumption here for causality would be that the, the assignment of people into a treatment and control group was truly random so that the, the assignment is not correlated with any other personal characteristics, preferences, and so on. It's completely independent of those. And then if, if we have random assignment, that is typically given, and then we can obviously con compare the, the mean of the treatment group and the mean of the control group and the difference we can ascribe to the treatment because our, with our randomization, we made sure that there is no other factor that could explain that difference. And so, 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 and, and, and this last statement, no other factor that could explain this, this difference is an example for an identifying assumption. So in, in any technique that we use here in this course, we will always need to think very carefully, well, what are the identifying assumptions? So how do we, how do we formalize causality in, in, uh, in econometrics or also in, you know, more, more generally? Um, so causality involves two random variables in that speak of causal inference, one is called the treatment and is typically denoted by D, and one is called the outcome that is typically denoted by Y, but obviously doesn't have to be. And the treatment can either be binary, 
So that's the classic example of a medical trial where people either get the blue pill or the red pill. Um, or, but it can also be continuous where people simply get a different dosage of the, of the treatment. And what, what we do is when we, we, we can speak of a causal effect of, of the treatment or the outcome, if a change in the treatment triggers a change in the outcome. So, so it's, it's very important, even though in economics, we often cannot run actual experiments, we think about causality in terms of an ideal experiment whereby we manipulate the treatment and then that and then we see whether that manipulation has an impact on the outcome hmm? so, so we can obviously not force firms to export or not or we cannot force people to go to the gym or not or uh, whatever other um, causal uh, effect that, that we want to study. But what we do is we look at the world or we, we look at, uh, you know, we, we try to see where can we find scenarios where we can ascribe such a causal interpretation um, because there was some force that manipulated the, the treatment for us. It's typically called a natural experiment. More on that later. Okay, but, but the important thing here is Think about the effect of a treatment on the outcome, which is also called treatment effect. Think about the treatment effect as a manipulation of the treatment by some experimenter that then affects the outcome. And here, uh, causal diagrams come into the equation. So, what causal diagrams, or DAGs as they are often called, help us is with is the following they help us to understand ourselves in a given context how we can identify causal effects from observational data because what they do is they make the assumptions the identifying assumptions transparent which is what other approaches named the uh, most importantly the potential outcomes framework doesn't do as clearly and it also helps us when you think about how you know econometrics is done when you learn it in your in your MSc is that you you know you have your relationship of interest and then you control for certain variables and some of you may ask themselves well what actually determines what we should control for but well, the, the the causal diagrams they they give you a good idea and help you in, in, in understanding which variables should and should you not control for. And that will be very, very important for anyone doing empirical work in their PhD or beyond. Now, DAGs don't come from econometrics, they come from computer science, where uh, especially the, the, the person uh, linked here uh, at the bottom, uh, Yudia Pearl, um, is a you know is, is a pioneer um, and he's he's a pioneer in the field of artificial intelligence and I can highly recommend you the book uh, that he published two years or three years ago called the book of why um, where he talks about the challenge of incorporating causal reasoning into an algorithm because you, as you will see throughout this course, establishing causality is very, very difficult. And we need to use our cognition to do that. But it's actually very, very challenging to teach that to a computer. And so for that, uh, uh, to, to allow a computer to, to solve basic causal problems, one needs a framework. And, and that's what he developed, the, the, the directed ASIC graphs for. So what are, what are DACs? Uh, what are causal diagrams? They're, they're actually quite simple, right? So, so they're, they're just a couple of letters and a couple of arrows, and that's it. The important, the, what makes them so important is that it allows you to, to put all the 
different variables that you're considering in, in, in your research design in order to test your cause hypothesis and put them in relation to one. Okay? So the basic ingredients are two um, or actually three. So they are nodes. So these are random variables. So take the example here, you have a treatment and you have the outcome. These are nodes and there is an arrow that that denotes the, the causal relationship between those two nodes. But the third ingredient is also very important, which is that if there is no arrow between two variables, it indicates the absence of a causal relationship. Okay, so suppose there was now a third variable here called A, and um, A affects D, but there is no arrow from A to Y, um, then that also means something. Because it means that there is no direct causal relationship from A to Y, but only through D. Now, you may ask yourself, well, how do I know that? Well, you don't. What, the, the, what this simple causal graph here is, is a representation of the theory, of your theory, or the theory of any researcher, how this how the, the relationship between those, those variables is organized. Some people may say, yeah, but there could be a direct effect from, from A to Y. And that then leads to obviously a discussion about the causal mechanisms that are at play here. But what it forces you as a, as a researcher, and that's why I'm teaching that stuff, is it forces you to take a stand on the relationships between the different variables that you either have in your model or should have in your model, but can't because you don't observe them. Okay, so we have the ingredients, nodes and arrows, and also missing arrows. And then we can look at different, different effects. So the, the, the effect that you can, can see that you can see here um, in the middle is what's called the, the direct effect, or is the direct causal effect, or oftentimes also called the treatment effect. Right? It's the effect, if I manipulate the treatment, what is the effect of that manipulation on the outcome? There could also be indirect causal effects. So for example, when a treatment affects another variable, which is called a mediator, and that then has an effect on the outcome. Right? Um, there is plenty of examples for that, that, that we will talk about. So for example, there's lots of randomized experiments where uh, people are not forced to participate in a program, but they get a voucher for, that, that allow them to participate. So for example, they get a voucher that allows them to move to a better neighborhood. Then the voucher would be the, the treatment, but then the actual, um, what the voucher does is it affects whether people actually move or not. And then we want to see, well, whether the, among those people who moved and, and who didn't, how does that affect their life outcome? How much they earn, how their children are doing their well-being and so on. You will learn a bit more. Uh, I wasn't exactly precise here with the language. When we talk about instrumental variables, we will use a more precise language of what D, X, and Y are in this case. But for the moment, the important thing here is that, um, that X is a mediator. Okay, so, so it lies on the causal path between the treatment and the outcome. And in many cases, you will see that there are, that, that there are many, many mediators one could think about. Right? So if I, if I zoom in here, um, think about the treatment is whether a person goes to the gym or not. Okay, so, so, so it's gym. And then uh, it's the outcome, let's say, is well-being. There is obviously many causal paths. So one is, uh, one is health. Uh, one is maybe perceived fitness. Um, there could be things like better sleep that then affects your well-being and so on and so forth. So that there is oftentimes there is mediators. And as we will see later in this lecture, mediators will 
will play an important role um, in in thinking about research. Now, we will use causal diagrams to introduce the first type of variable that we encounter and that actually makes econometrics and makes research design so hard and that is confounders okay. um, so that the, the, the fundamental challenge that anyone who, who wants to do causal work has is to separate the causal effect so that would be in this graph the effect of d on y from the influence of a confounder and the confounder is a variable that affects both at the same time we will learn, you know, this, this is obviously a very, very uh, common scenario. So, so think again about um, the D being whether a person regularly goes to a gym or not, and Y being well-being. Um, there is lots of variables that probably determine both. Okay, so, so if a person um, is, is healthier to begin with, they probably feel better and they're more likely to go to the gym. But it's, we cannot, if we simply observe uh, whether a person goes to the gym and their well-being, we can't really say whether it's driven by their health or by uh, the actual act of going to the gym. We don't know that. And, so, and, so, and, and, and it's our job as researchers to disentangle the treatment effect we're interested in from, these, from, from those influence of those confounders. So what we do with causal diagrams, obviously in a simple one with three variables, this is easy, but if you have more variables that you need to think about, then that gets harder. Um, but here what we do is we, we look at all the paths from the treatment to the outcome. And the rule is here that you should not get through the, or move through the treatment a second time. So, so here this is obviously very simple. You have two paths. One is the direct path from D to Y, and one is the back, the so-called backdoor path. Okay, so so that, that, that's the path through X. And it's not here that the causality goes in uh, along those green arrows that I drew here. It's just to think about the, you know, where does the path go? So, so first of all, we think about well, which variables are on that path? And in the second step, and this is what you see down here, we describe the relationship uh, in turn with those arrows. And so a, a uh, confounder um, is a variable from which two arrows point away. As you can see with the X up there in, in, in the DAG, and you can see also here at the, uh, at the bottom, when we talk about the backdoor path. And, and so um, if there is a variable that from which the arrows point away and there is no collider on that path, what that is we will learn in the next video, um, then we say that the backdoor path is open. And what a, an open backdoor path means is it means that that the, the, the treatment effect is confounded by that, that confounding variable, by x in this case. And so what we need to do is, if the, if the backdoor path is open, we need to close it. And the way we do this is by conditioning on or adjusting for or controlling for that confounder x. Now, you may have heard this all before um, and, and think this is trivial, but you, you'd be surprised how many people make mistakes and how many researchers who earn a decent paycheck uh, from their craft and make mistakes not noticing what are confounders and what may be mediators and lighters. So think about that uh, when, when you do your own. Now, the, the big problem is that oftentimes we don't observe 
the confounder. So we know that it might be important. Again, this is theory. We, we think theoretically it's important. But we don't observe it in our data. And so so it, there is, for example, in trade, there is a huge literature on uh, the effect of exporting on all sorts of things, workers' wages, uh, innovation, and so on. But there is obviously, it's not random which firms actually export and which don't. Right? And, and the, the variables that determine um, whether a firm exports or not, what industry they're in, how talented their managers are, um, you know, lots of other, you know, the, the, the finance they have in place and so on, that determines whether they export as well as whether they, uh, they have, you know, how successful they are, which, is, which would be one outcome. Um, but we don't observe all of the variables that would join the two. May, may observe some, but not all. That's the problem. Okay? So, so to put this in, into a slightly uh, simpler case, or to, to look at a slightly simpler, simpler case, assume that there is only one such variable that we don't. And so the problem here is often called selection into treatment. Right? So, so if you think about your, your, your micro course, what we learn if people make rational choices, they may not always make the perfect choices, but we shouldn't also assume that people are stupid. People choose intentionally, typically. And the same goes for firms and governments. They don't just choose randomly. Firms don't choose randomly whether they export or not. People don't randomly choose um, whether they attend a gym or not. It's not random who becomes unemployed and who doesn't. And so the, 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 any of those determinants of who selects into the treatment and who doesn't are good candidates for, um, for, also for confounders that also affect the outcome. So the big challenge for any causal research is what to do with those confounders that we cannot observe. That's what most of this course is about. So here you see two of the examples. But what I want to do in, in the last part of this video is I want to look at slightly more complex causal relationships. These are still not, as, as you will see, they're still quite simplistic, but they just show you in the direction in which this, is, this, this could be going also in your own work. So up here, you have four variables. Okay, so, so what we are interested in is the effect of, um, of education on earnings. That's the main causal effect of interest that, that we're after. Because a classic question in labor economics is, uh, what is the return to one more year of education? Do I get a higher wage? And, and, and if so, how, how big is that? And now there are obviously other variables in the background that we can think about that are confounders. Okay? And um, I've just put them here as, as one example how they could be related, but that's obviously that's the result of my theory that may or may not be the right one. So uh, let's think about, uh, so, so what are those three? Um, we have family income, that's I, and if the, if the arrow is solid, it means we observe that. Uh, you also sometimes see that uh, variables that are observed have a solid um, frame around them, and then variables that are unobserved, like unobserved parental background, have a dashed frame around them. You, you sometimes see that. And um, so we have parental education, family income, and unobserved family background. Okay? And so now we have to think, well, how are Suppose these are all the variables that play a role here. How are they related? There could obviously be more variables that play a role here. Then we would have to incorporate them, and the, the 
relationships between those variables with additional arrows, but you can obviously see how the, the number of arrows with every additional variable multiplies. So, so let's keep it simple. Um, and so here, again, what we do here now is, the first thing is we, we have to establish what we believe, given our theory, that that looks like. Causal relationship between all those variables look. And then in a second step, we map out all the paths from the treatment to the outcome, regardless of the direction of the arrows. The only thing that we, we are not supposed to do is go through the treatment twice or through the outcome. This is at the start should, of a path should be the treatment and at the end of the path should be the outcome. Then we think about the, 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 the arrows in between. So what do we have there? Um, we have obviously the causal effect, that's the green uh, arrow that I already drew. Then we have um, the backdrop path number one, which again, I'm, I'm just going to draw arrows from treatment to outcome. So that's number one. Um, that's obviously the one we see here. We can clearly see that I is a confounder. Okay, so parental income, yeah, should be a confounder. If, if uh, parents have uh, greater financial means, that makes it easier for children to attend more education. But parents with greater financial means typically also can enhance their, their children's skills and ultimately their earnings in other ways. So this is clearly a confounder. Now, this, the second path is one that goes from D to EE, so which is parental education, then to I, and then to Y. So that's number two. Um, again, it doesn't go a second time through the treatment. That's not allowed, but, but that's the second, second causal path. The third one is even trickier because it is the, it's going to do that in purple now, from the treatment to basic education through parental education, uh, sorry, B was uh, unobserved family background, parental education, parental income, and then we go to the outcome Y. So you can see here now, this is back to path number three. This is so, again, the two steps are, first of all, think about what the DAG looks like. Second thing is, write down all the paths from the treatment to the outcome, including the backdoor path. And now we have to analyze what those backdoor paths are what those variables are and which ones are confounders. And could it be that if we adjust for one confounder, that we can close a backdoor path? That's, that's what, we're, what we're doing here. And um, let me just erase this very quickly. Um, so let's, let's look at the backdoor path one first. So here clearly parental education is a confounder. We, we, can, we can see this straight away. So if we adjust for parental education, this is basically as if it just disappeared from that DAC. So I can either cross it out here or if I want to do this more neatly, then I would simply say the E affects D affects Y, and then there is B left here. Okay. So now when we look at the at the cost diagram that is left after we've adjusted for for uh, for parental income. We see that if this is the correct, if we initially have the correct model, so the cor correct relationships between all those variables, then there is no more variable we need to adjust for, right? Because there is no confounder here. So even if the unobserved parental background 
yeah, there may be differences, but if those differences do not have an effect on the outcome, it doesn't matter. So if we observe parental education, and if parental education has no, as I draw it here in blue, has no direct effect on the outcome, we don't need to adjust for it. So if that blue arrow we believe is there, then we should adjust for it. If it's not there, then all that conditioning on parental income does is it, it brings us from, from the initial DAG, let's call this number one, it brings us to number two. Um, and number two would be without this, this blue arrow. And we'd, we'd be done. We do, would not need to adjust any further. And now think about this process relative to what you've learned in, 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 in your masters, which is just there, yeah, just control for anything you can possibly throw into a regression, right? which is oftentimes called a kitchen sink regression. Um, right, so, so here, this is, this is uh, the, the opposite end of the spectrum of what one should do, which is make all the, all the relationships between variables transparent and then think about which are the ones you need to adjust for and which, of, which are the ones you don't need to adjust. And here, what controlling for I does is it closes back to path number two and it closes back to path number three and it closes back to path number two. And so by controlling for I, we move to, to DAG number two up here, and we can simply run now, a re we can you know, run a regression, for example, or do matching and simply adjust for, for parental income through those techniques. And that would then allow us to get at the causal effect from education to earnings, and we wouldn't need to worry about parental education and any other family factor. Now, the challenging thing is, of course, that all this is based on our own theory, and our theory may be wrong. So, so think about a model like this, where unobserved family background um, has a has an effect on Y, and uh, we can see this here through this arrow down here. Now, if that's the case, conditioning on I, on parental income, will be important because it closes, um, it closes, let me draw this in orange, it closes this backdoor path and it closes this backdoor path that runs through parental education. But, we would still have the problem that the unobserved background confounds the relationship because it affects the treatment and the outcome simultaneously. And so if we cannot control for unobserved parental background, and if that's the correct model that I've shown here in this DAG, then we, we know that our estimate is most likely biased. And that is obviously not what we want because we want an unbiased estimate of that causal effect. So to summarize, what have we done in this video? We've introduced DAX as a very important tool for causal inference. My guess is that over the next 10 years, this will become more and more important um, in economics papers. So at the moment, you don't see them printed in economics papers. But that does not mean that people are not using them. They're using them oftentimes as tools in the background to think about their research design. And then they write down the, the, the results from, from the DAG in plain English or in plain economists' English. It's but they are very, very important because they force us to take a stand on causal relationships between variables. And they help us to, to understand for ourselves which variables should we include in a model and which we should not. And there are two types of variables that we will encounter in the next lecture or in the next video, which, is, which are bad controls 
and colliders, which I will show you, you encounter very often. And you can even see those, those issues in papers that have been published in the past in top journals. Um, but actually, these are sources, these are very, very strong, uh, are sources of a very strong bias or can be. And so they need to be taken seriously. And DAGs help us to make these problems transparent. That, that's why I'm teaching them here in this course. 